sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And to proceed, brothers and sisters, I trust you're well. I trust you're in a good state of Iman and you're happy that we've uh, come on the air, although it is, it's actually an hour later than we've advertised. So we do apologize. It was because of the, uh, the confusion of international time zones with Sheikh Bilal being in Africa, I being in the UK, and all the brothers being in New Zealand, in Auckland. This confused all of us, subhanAllah, and messed it up. So I do apologize, brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for being patient, and it's great that you're here anyway. This is the Voice of Islam platform, New Zealand, a DAWA organization calling brothers and sisters in humanity to Islam around the world, but particularly focusing in New Zealand. And I'm here with our Honorable Sheikh, Sheikh Bilal Phillips, all the way from Addis Ababa today. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> MashaAllah. My pleasure I to be hope. here. It's a pleasure to see you as well. And, and this is going to be a very exciting series that we've got coming up. We've done successful habits of uh, a, a basically a parent, of a, a, you know, how to bring up Muslim children. We went through those seven habits. We're going to go through another seven habits, Sheikh, today, uh, isn't it? Uh, which is about the successful, a truly successful human being. What are the attributes that... Uh, come together the seven most important attributes that Sheikh is going to talk to us about one by one, which will account for what a successful human being is. Subhanallah. What a very important topic this one is today. So Sheikh Bilal, let's uh, kick it off with number one, shall we? Inshallah. Bismillah. Actually, before... Before we actually go into our uh, topic, after asking Allah's peace and blessings, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and on all those who follow his path of righteousness until the last day, the origin of this title, the seven habits of truly successful people or human beings is a book which is a million seven, 10 years, 20 years back, 20 years back, um, by Stephen Covey called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And a number of other books have come out carrying the same approach of analyzing common characteristics and practices of those who have achieved financial success, success in this world. So some of the habits which they identify are universal principles from which really anyone can benefit while others benefit only those whose world outlook is based on the belief that this life is all there is. As for those whose world outlook is based on the belief that this life is only a stepping stone to the next life, and that success in the, the next life is the real goal, their criteria for success will be substantially different. Real success in this life comes from developing a realistic dimension to one's belief in God that produces practical uh, activities indicating or expressing the proper understanding of the humankind's relationship with God and with the creation in which we live. So in simple terms, it means doing the things which will enable one to attain ultimate success in the next life. 
it could be looked at from the perspective of Stephen Covey's second habit, which is beginning with the end in mind. You know, if we use this principle, which is, it makes sense for a believer, financial success in the material world is of no value if it means failure in the life to come. On the other hand, if what we perceived as failure in this world will give a person success in the life to come, then it's better to fail in this world than to succeed. I mean, if this, these are the options. But this doesn't mean that Islam promotes negligence of this life for the sake of the next, as promoted by some religious uh, systems where this whole life is evil and you just abandon it. No, Islam teaches that we should seek the best of both worlds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said a prayer in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 201, Our Lord grant us good in this life and in the next and shield us from the hellfire. And also in Surah Al-Qasas, verse 77, we find Allah saying there, وَابْتَغِي فِي مَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَنْسَى نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Seek the next life in what Allah has given you. Whatever Allah has given us in this world, we should seek the next life with it. That should be our main focus. But Allah goes on to say, but don't forget Get your portion of this life. So don't forget, don't just abandon this life. So ultimate success in life is the attainment of God's pleasure in this life and the reward of paradise in the next. In order to achieve this true form of success, there are a number of basic principles in this life. For example, Prophet Muhammad said, Ad-dunya sijn mu'min wa jannatul kafir. This life is a prison for the believer and a paradise for the disbeliever. He also said, Hujibatin naru bi shahawat. The hellfire is veiled by pleasurable things. Wa hujibatil bil makari. And paradise is veiled by things which the desires dislike. This is reality. So one approach of some Muslim intellectuals to books like that has been to accept all their fundamental principles while trying to find Islamic texts carrying similar meaning and interpreting them accordingly. However, since the goals of the vast majority of people studied in the motivational books are fundamentally different from those of the believers, it would be more appropriate to find a group of truly successful Muslims on whose habits a Muslim presentation of this topic could be based. The group I have chosen are those whom Prophet Muhammad Sallam promised paradise in this life. Without a shadow of a doubt, they represent the truly successful people in this life. Especially since his promises, that is Prophet Muhammad Sallam's promises, were based on divine revelation and not his personal preferences or guesses. So the truly successful people, we can start before looking at the habits, the truly successful people are those people guaranteed paradise. There were 10 and more actually, but 
10 most people uh, are aware of muslims are aware of the 10 who are promised paradise they they are abu bakr omar ali Uthman ibn Affan, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, Al-Zubair ibn al-Awam, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and Sa'id ibn Zayd. These are the well-known ten. Right? However, besides these famous ten, the Prophet ﷺ also promised a number of others among his companions, his wives, among his wives, as well as groups who were present at certain major events during his lifetime. One might imagine that such a promise would have caused his followers to become spiritually lazy. You're guaranteed paradise, so, you know, you can just take it easy, relax. No, you don't really need to make any effort. However, due to their high levels of faith, his promise didn't make them lazy in the least. Instead, it urged them on to greater heights in deeds of righteousness. For example, when Abu Bakr was on his deathbed, fervently supplicating and seeking Allah's forgiveness, he was reminded by those present that Allah had, uh, the, had promised through the Prophet ﷺ, had promised him paradise. Prophet ﷺ gave him a promise of paradise. Abu Bakr's response was, even if one of my feet were in paradise and the other outside of it, I would not feel confident and certain of Allah's plan. I wouldn't take anything for granted. So the presentation I'll be sharing with you gives us a brief look into some of the, their extraordinary lives, these who were promised paradise, in order to identify some of the major characteristics which made them unique and guaranteed them paradise. All of the special characteristics which these companions developed are encouraged in one way or another by the teachings of Islam. I mean, they didn't come up with something which is outside the, the realm or the bounds of Islam, something special, known only to special people. However, many, if not most people today, have lost sight of the importance of these characteristics or these habits due to the many distractions of the overwhelming material world in which we live today. Thus, the primary goal of this presentation is to remind the believers and myself, first and foremost, of some of the critical habits which we must develop in order to attain real success in this life and the next. So having said that, let us now move on to habit number one. That is, correct your beliefs and your understandings. The first and most important key habit to attain ultimate success is to find the correct belief in God based on the correct understanding of this world and the purpose of human existence. The Prophet ﷺ stated it very plainly. Man qala la ilaha Allah dakhal al jannah. Whoever says there is no God worthy of worship but Allah will enter paradise. Of course, there are many other narrations where he said uh, that whoever said la ilaha Allah uh, sincerely from his heart, you know, with certainty of uh, from his heart, uh, a number of others, uh, you know, clarifying points, you know, so that. We don't just say, okay, that person, he hasn't believed all his life. He, he, he's a disbeliever, but on his deathbed, he says, la ilaha illallah, and he goes to paradise. No, it doesn't work like that. You know. So this has to do with saying it with sincerity and with certainty. One is sure about this. 
That one is not just saying it because people said it. So correct belief begins with certainty about God's existence. Logic and common sense demand belief in God. The alternative of chance producing this world out of the Big Bang is equivalent to the belief that the explosion of a bomb in a junkyard could produce a Rolls Royce with keys in the ignition, engine running, ready for somebody just to open the door, get in, and drive away. You drop enough bombs, and the atheists actually claim this, you drop enough bombs in that junkyard, eventually, one, if you have infinite time, one of those bombs is going to hit the junkyard just in the right way and produce that Rolls Royce. Perfect. Of course, this is ludicrous because the chance of it happening on the billionth try is no different from the chance of it happening on the first try. And what is the chance? Zero. So for belief about God to be correct, it must be supported by correct knowledge. Now, after we get past the point of is there a God or are we here by chance? Leave that aside. Incorrect knowledge will lead the believer to incorrect forms of worship involving shirk or idolatry. Consequently, great stress has been placed in Islam on learning and teaching. Allah Praise the knowledgeable in the Quran saying, Indeed, among Allah's servants, it is the scholars who truly fear him. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, made seeking knowledge a religious obligation on all Muslims, saying, Talabul ilmi farid ala kulli Muslim. Seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. And he further promised paradise for those who sincerely seek it, saying, Allah makes the path to paradise easy for one who sets out on a path seeking knowledge. So that first habit is on one hand to ensure your belief in God because nobody's going to make it to paradise who disbelieves in God. So that's a starting point. But then also your belief in God should be correct. So if you believe in God as three in one, or... Bismillah. An... Assalamu alaikum. Are you still there? Wa alaikum salam. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah. I think we might have uh, just temporarily lost... Lost? The, uh, ...which constitute the truly what? successful person uh, sorry, Sheikh Bilal, you cut out, cut out quite badly then. Um, if you can just go back a little bit. To what point? Uh, <laughs> well, you would, so you would... Okay, you were just talking about the first point of a successful human being, but uh, I, it completely cut out. Um, for me, I don't know if it was cutting out for everyone else. It might have just been me. <laughs> so I probably just when, when you when you were present when you were talking, I heard your sound cutting out from time to time. Uh, yeah, you know, there were chunks that were missing. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, okay, just continue then, Shay. Don't worry. Just uh, continue. Maybe it was me. <laughs> well, I don't know. We have some chat here saying one person said we heard everything. It did not cut oh. off from this. Oh, oh. Uh, so it's okay. you. It's probably me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the UK that's got the problem. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so um, yeah. Yeah, I was basically just summing up this, you know, the, the concept for habit number one that uh, it's correct belief. You know, we have to correct our beliefs. We have to be open to correcting our beliefs. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said seeking knowledge is an obligation, a religious obligation on yeah. every, Muslim. every Muslim. So 
we have to be, you know, we can't just say, okay, I was born Muslim. You know, everybody in my family is Muslim. I know what it is to be a Muslim and I know what, you know, who Allah is. And well, yeah, you may have some general idea, but maybe that knowledge that you were given, you know, had weaknesses in it, had problems in it. You know, so you should be open to correct those beliefs. You know, uh, knowledge is a key factor in uh achieving that success because even if you know yeah Allah's name you know that God is Allah and um, you're supposed to worship him but you your understanding of what it means to worship him you know is the kind of prayer for example you say oh yeah we have to pray five times a day but you know remember the man who came in the masjid and uh he made two rak'ah and went to sit with the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, you know, in front of the other companions, go back and pray because you didn't pray. And the man went back and prayed again, two rak'ah, and then he came. And he told him, go back. And he did it a third time, told him to go back. And finally, the man said, oh, well, that's the only prayer I know, O Messenger of Allah. Ah, tell me, how should I pray? So that knowledge was now given to him so that proper prayer was the way forward. That, that, that's the real prayer. Doing it accord, in accordance with how the Prophet ﷺ taught the prayer. So just saying, you know, they have the term namazi in, some, in South, South, uh, East, South India or Pakistan and elsewhere. Namazi, the person is a namazi. He prays or she prays. <laughs> but it just means they pray, you know, whether they pray all five prayers in a day together or, you know, they, they pray outside of its time, late, it's, uh, they pray. That's enough. But no, it's not enough. It is praying according to the way the Prophet ﷺ prayed. As he said, Sallu kamara aitumuni usalli. So it's just not enough to say, I pray. You should be praying according to how the Prophet prayed. So, knowledge of the deen is critical. This is a part of that first habit developing knowledge, having knowledge, developing a thirst for knowledge, always being open to knowledge. And if we look at uh, Omar ibn al Khattab and his state of knowledge, you know, why the Prophet ﷺ listed him among the ten who he listed at one time, promised paradise. We can find in a hadith, which was narrated by Umar ibn Khattab's son, Abdullah, he said that on one occasion, Allah's messenger said, while I was sleeping, I dreamt that a cup of milk was offered to me. I drank from it until its freshness reflected through my fingernails. Then I gave the remainder to Omar ibn al-Khattab. This is in the Prophet's dream. The people present asked him, O Messenger of Allah, how do you interpret that? He said, it refers to knowledge. It refers to knowledge. And actually what we can see is that on a number of occasions, there were times when the uh, revelation which came to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu confirmed the opinions of Omar ibn al-Khattab and his suggestions. Whether it was concerning the, bat the prisoners of the Battle of Badr or the veiling of the Prophet Sallallahu's wives, you know, these were all incidents which took place in the lives of the Prophet Sallallahu in which Omar ibn al-Khattab's knowledge stood out. For example, in the case of the Battle of Badr, as I mentioned, after the captives were gathered, the Prophet ﷺ asked Abu Bakr and Omar, what should he do? What, is, what was their opinion with regards to this? captives, what should we do with them? Abu Bakr, he said, 
They are our relatives. My opinion is that you should take ransom from them and it will be a source of strength for us against the pagans. And perhaps Allah may guide them to Islam. You know, they are our relatives. The Prophet ﷺ then asked Omar ibn al-Khattab and Omar, he said, no, by Allah, O Messenger of Allah, I don't support the opinion of Abu Bakr. Instead, my opinion is that you should hand them over to us so that we may cut off their heads. Ali should be given Aqil, his brother, to cut his head off and hand over this relative of mine so I can cut his head off. They are the leaders of the disbelievers and their financiers. The Prophet ﷺ, you know, being the gentle prophet that he was, he approved the opinion of Abu Bakr and not Omar's. The next day, when Omar went to see the Messenger of Allah, he found both himself and Abu Bakr sitting crying. So he asked, O Messenger of Allah, why are you and your companion crying? Tell me the reason, so that I may also cry. And if not, I will at least pretend to cry out of sympathy for you. The Messenger of Allah replied, I'm crying for what has happened to your companions for taking the ransom. I was shown the punishment that they were to be subjected to. And it was brought as close to me as this tree next to me. Then Allah revealed the verse, it is not befitting for a prophet to take prisoners. Until the force of the disbelievers has been crushed. So consume the, the spoils of war and so on and so on, the rest of the verse. But the key was, they were to be executed. Omar ibn al-Khattab's opinion was confirmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there were other occasions. Uh, because our time is limited, I'm not going to go into all of them, but uh, enough to say that Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, very uh, big apologies. Uh, Sheikh Bilal looks like he's gone offline for a little a few moments. I thought it was me again. That's why I didn't interject. So apologies. He will be coming back on. So don't leave us, guys. Don't leave us. Uh, we're going to go. We're going through the seven habits of a successful human being in this world. And we talked about the first um, issue being, well, first of all, you have to be a Muslim and um, attain the correct knowledge. Attain the correct knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, uh, and the messenger of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's sunnah. Uh, the, the video was stopped for Sheikh Bilal. Um, am I also frozen? Can you just tell me, am I frozen? What's happening? Not really sure what's going on, but you know, this is the problem with this online stuff. It is virtual, but uh, let us know. Yeah. So, yep, the first no, habit. Yusuf, you're, uh, you're, you are okay, inshallah. Just uh, Sheikh Bilal is having issues. I'm okay, I'm okay. You're okay, Fine. yes. Okay, yes. great. I'll, I'll so, put myself here for so, now just in case you get confused. Yeah, I'm, yeah we are, we're still live. We're just still waiting for Sheikh Bilal. That's right. We'll wait for Sheikh Bilal to come back because it's very difficult to know whether it's you or it was Sheikh Bilal or whatever is happening. But anyway, what I was going to say is so we're basically the, to, for us to, to be a Muslim and to seek correct knowledge 
is the first habit that Sheikh Bilal was talking about. Uh, so <laughs> everyone's confirming now. It's not me that's frozen. No, it's um, not you. Sheikh Bilal was not just frozen. He's just disappeared. He's coming back, inshallah. It's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make it easy for him to come back. He's in Addis Ababa, and he is uh, coming on weekly with us uh, here on the Voice of Islam platform, inshallah. talking about... In, in, in the in seven habits of successful human being in this world. And we talked about that first one, of course, um, he referred, uh, Sheikh referred to a number of books that are written by non-Muslims, uh, particularly Stephen Covey, of seven habits of a successful human being. But of course, then he referred to the fact that th these people only have a very narrow view. They only have a view of this dunya. And then after the dunya, there is just nothing according to them. So this is the first habit which they've got wrong, basically, because they only see this as a very narrow concern. This is only for us um, a passing through. We're just um, travelers in this world. Uh, we see this life as just a transient affair. And then the real life, which lasts forever after the grave, is, of course, subhanAllah, the Firdaus al Allah, inshallah, we, have, we pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us that. So, um, <clears throat> that, it's very good to know that a lot of people are saying, no, uh, you know, <laughs> you're, still, uh, you're still alive and we can still, still hear you <laughs> all around the world. The brothers, uh, there's over 667 people right now uh, watching this uh, affair, and there was so. I'm happy that you guys have joined us. Uh, let's try and find out one of us what's happened with Sheikh Bilal. Um, let's just see. Here we are. Bilal, Dr. Bilal is usually having internet issues. <laughs> Somebody said, his PA just said, but he, he's trying to come back on, guys. So don't yeah, uh, go anywhere. He'll be joining us, soon, inshallah. So, <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, so a few, few brothers giving salam to you, Yusuf. Yeah, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That's uh, Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad uh, there is giving salam. Is it permissible to make a cartoon movie about the Prophet? Oh my goodness! No, we won't be addressing that issue. Uh, I think we better leave that one totally out. If it's in, if it's doubtful, we just leave it away. Absolutely no way that we're going to do that. Inshallah. Inshallah. And let the scholars uh, speak in unison on these issues. We will uh, leave it away. We certainly don't want to cause death and destruction. Islam is about bringing peace and harmony to the world. <laughs> uh, Tawfiq is saying he needs to check his router, or router as the Americans say, right? Router or router? Uh, router or router, yeah. To uh so share we have i'm not seeing share still um so but he said he's coming so on the on the whatsapp so we'll just wait inshallah um another few yeah. more minutes good absolutely and uh, we of course lost um muhammad thompson um earlier on as well um so <laughs> we've lost two people one went to sleep and the other one um decided to uh Probably had a problem with the internet, yes. 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 Um, Salam alaikum from Ethiopia. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We've got salam, salam alaikum brothers. Wa alaikum salam from uh, Niaz. Keep it going. He's saying keep it going. But the problem is I don't have the notes in front of me. That's the thing. <laughs> Jake Bilal has the notes in front of him. And he's been doing this for uh, probably 50 years, subhanAllah. Uh, yeah. The show must not stop. I agree with you. <laughs> Sheikh Bilal is not here, but Sheikh uh, Bilal Shafi is here. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> 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 there we are, man. <laughs> uh, it's getting Love a bit dangerous here. <laughs> yeah, getting, getting salam we, from the US. Oh, uh, salam, uh, yeah. We got salam from Toronto. From Toronto. Sheikh Bilal is in Addis Ababa. May Allah bless and give him barakah to the shukh. Ameen. Next Amen. year, uh, six something like six trillion people will watch, inshallah. Inshallah. God knows. <laughs> six million or is that six billion or whatever it is. 
Assalamu alaikum from Leicester. Wa alaikum salam. I'm in Leicester in the heart of the city of Leicester. Uh, so, uh, yeah, from Kosovo. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah. Sheikh hasn't come yet. Well, Sheikh was here and he's gone through virtually the whole of point number one for the successful habits of being a human being in this world. No, the um, class is not done yet. Yeah. No, it's definitely not done, is it? Yes, the class is not done yet. So those who are asking, we were just waiting for yeah. Sheikh Bilal. Um, so we're holding it at the moment. So we're hoping he'll be back in a few minutes, inshallah. Yeah. So guys, in the meantime, uh, there's a few questions about how to join the um, online in, uh, university or it used to be the Islamic online university. So there is a uh, chance. Could you, would you be able to put a link up um, for those? Yes, it's not uh, Islamic online university anymore. It's international no. open university. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we will, I will yeah. share the link now, inshallah. And so to those who are asking, um, National Open University. So now when I come from Pakistan, is seen the videos, packed social media. Yeah, wa alaikum salam. Seen the videos, we continue to do those for those and um, from New Zealand. Yes, he is. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Voice of Islam team there, Dawa team there. Uh, salams from Toronto, Salams from Mo Melbourne, Mashallah, Wa alaikum salam. Queensland, Australia, Salam alaikum. Indonesia, Salam alaikum. Bangladesh, <laughs> Subhanallah. <laughs> oh, I can't get Liberia, Liberia, Germany, Germany. We've got Germany online as well. Um, salam alaikum to all of you guys. As We're a still waiting for Sheikh Bilal to come back, by the way. Oh, we've got Karachi online as well. Somaliland. Yeah. Um, there's a lesson for new converts such as myself in the university. Yes, there is. That's correct. There's loads That's of stuff. Loads correct. of stuff. You need to sign up a course. I've done part, I've done some of the courses on there as well. So uh, that's the link, that's that's the link on there. Jenna, and everyone else. Gambia, Somalia. The, the link is there, right? Yes, yeah, the link is down there. Yep, yep. It, it's just down there somewhere that way. Woo, I can't get it right. <laughs> Chad, Sumatra, Afghanistan. We've got watching us. Um, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Cape Town. MashaAllah, Cape Town, Bahrain. Uh, I see it. Thank you. As somebody says, yeah. So, South Africa again. We've got a whole world watching us. Belize. Los Angeles, uh, USA, Tonga, Malaysia, Macedonia, Tonga. Philippines, Florida, Bulgaria, Lahore, mashallah. We've got Jordan and we've got Sudan and Bangladesh. We've had loads of people in Bangladesh. Lots of people watching from Nigeria. Big up Nigeria there. Um, yeah. Understand the existence of Allah and the sincerity of your belief and correct knowledge was the first point that Sheikh Bilal came up with. And I don't, I haven't got the notes, so I can't start number two without Sheikh Bilal being there. I do think that there is a major problem with the internet there, though. Oh, we've got California, USA on. Um, live. We need to get more lives going. Kashmir, Nigeria, France, Sweden, India, USA, India again. Uh, what time did you start? 10 uh, a.m. Uh, that's 10 a.m. UK time. Yes. UK time. And we're also going live tonight uh, talking about difficult questions. Um, I'm going to have a couple of shiuch on there as well, some interesting people. Yep. Uh, Kashmir from the Valley of the Oppressed People. May Allah stop their oppression and grant them fiddos al ala and patience beyond belief, the patience of Ayub, I mean. I, mean. I took a diploma from the university in, my, in the fifth semester of, for my bachelor's from Ethiopia. There we are, the Sakina. So she's doing a, a great course. It's hard to get Islamic talks in English uh, these days. I agree with you. It used to be very commonplace, and now there's a dwindling of that. But you can go online and watch on YouTube. Just put in any topic in and you can find it. Oh, I think Sheikh Bilal is here, so I'll bring him on in chat. Yeah. Uh, okay, and I'm, I'll, I'll excuse myself again, brothers. Yeah. Salam alaikum, Sheikh Bilal. Electricity just went. went. Ah. Alaikum salam. 
السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. سيدي سيدي وين 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 رين ستورم هير. سبحان الله. Sadly yeah. enough, yeah. that was the factor. You can see out my window. You can see yeah. the rain. You can hear the thunder. Yeah. Uh, pretty heavy. Anyway, I, I've, I've connected it to my uh, to hotspot on my phone using mobile data. Yeah. So I don't know if, if you want me to continue. I'm thinking yeah, that in this out. kind of situation, it's probably better just to try to record it. You know, yeah. <laughs> to record it and just send it to you. Well, yeah. you know, Jake Bilal, there's 600 people online uh, live. There's 611 people right now. And let's just, so let's just um, confirm exactly just to go through the first point very briefly for those people that have just joined us. And then just go to move on to uh, point number two as well. Inshallah. If you're comfortable with that, Sheikh. Yes. I think uh, it's having difficulty, uh, Yusuf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, we can hear the rains uh, in the background there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Everybody's okay. saying. Uh, I'm going uh, to to a back. better hotspot. Because... Yeah. Okay, we'll just wait. Um, Sheikh Bala, we we need to do a we need to do a fundraising. Uh, uh, I'm anyway, satellite. Uh, I'm happy to be back. <laughs> I'll, I'll switch over to another uh, hotspot, which may be better. Four G, mine is like three G. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, I got a, go it's a comment here. Nobody likes YouTube. We all need lives. So, did you see that, Yusuf? Yeah. <laughs> what do you say? So, Shane, no one wants to do lives. We all channel. want lives. <laughs> <laughs> we, want to, we want to see the real McCoy live, <laughs> so to speak. It's, it's, it's incredible that so many people are staying on. Yeah. No shake. Uh, Shake it here. Well, you know, they can't tell the difference. They couldn't tell the difference if I, if I recorded it and then you guys just played it. So, okay, here is Chef Bilal. You know, just played it. It would be, you know, it would really, they couldn't tell the difference technically. So, but that way you just be ensuring that I, the whole thing would not be disrupted. We've been successful so far, you know. Yes. Yeah. So I think, Shay, we can continue now. I think you look stable now. Um, your picture may so, not so be you good. Want me to, you want me to uh, try, try to reconnect? Um, as I said, I'm on a 3G uh, hotspot. I'm trying to connect to a 4G, which would be more reliable. Okay. Somebody's asking questions. Is it permissible to play video games? Well, as long as there's no haram in it, you can play it. <laughs> you don't waste your time and miss salah. Then you can pray. It. Inshallah. Uh, anyway, um, so shall I do that? Try yes. to switch over. Get back yeah. to you guys. Yeah, go for it. Okay, we'll wait. So it shouldn't be too far away. All right. Okay, so he's not that far away. He was only in Addis Ababa, you know, after all. <laughs> yes, so um, Sheikh Bilal was talking about the uh, seven habits of uh, being a successful human being in this world. Uh, and then he referred to being, uh, you know, upon correct knowledge. First of all, one should follow the correct knowledge. And of course, you should be a Muslim. You know, that's the first thing. If you want to be successful in this world, first, number one thing is you have to submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in accordance to the correct knowledge sent down by Allah to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the righteous, uh, pious predecessors, which is uh, what Sheikh was talking about in the first point. Uh, and then he referred to some of the knowledgeable people in this world who have um, detached themselves or detached success from being one of being a believer, right? 
so that he's talking about only for financial success um, and economic success or um, success in the dunya. Well, success in the dunya for Muslims, of course, uh, pertains to their adherence to the Quran and the Sunnah. So this is what Sheikh is talking about. He's come back, so let's hope we've got for some 4G footage for you. It looks, uh, it looks very good, the connection, so continue, inshallah. So I'm just going to excuse myself. Okay, Sheikh. Well, no, actually, we're still on the 3G, and, oh. and I'm getting a sign saying something went wrong. Try reloading the page. Uh, yeah. Sheikh, we, we can yeah, hear you really well. We can hear you really not, well. Um, it's not connecting properly. Uh, we can hear you really well, and your connection here is actually quite good. So, um, yeah, but know. there's a sign coming up on the side here saying, you know, connection is bad. Try reloading your page. Mm. Um, okay. You can should we, should we, uh, uh, I didn't get the 4G. <laughs> let let me didn't. just see if I can do it. Uh, okay. Should we, um, should we try to maybe abort this particular thing and then reestablish yep. the program again later on? Today? Yeah, yeah. I think um, we'll see what the. Um, so oh. I don't know. So we'll just ask our viewers. Um, they're still holding on. So do you guys want us yeah. to or do you want to uh, to uh, do it at a different time? Inshallah. I think. Well. <clears throat> yeah. We've got people talking about music. We've got to, people talking about all sorts of things in the chat there. Uh, but uh, the, like we mentioned, uh, Sheikh Bilal's university uh, is the place to go for, for correct knowledge, because this was the first point to attain correct knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, International Open University, iou.edu.gm. That was the one that you, uh, if you log on to there, you can actually go and do a course. SubhanAllah. Um, you can learn correct knowledge. That's the first bit. That's the first uh, point. Uh, right. Any luck or any joy, Sheikh Bilal? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm on the 4G now. So yep. I mean, it looks I'm better. Making it it's better. You can see a difference. Yep, huge difference, yes. <clears throat> okay. Mm. Should have started with that. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> everything else was in place, you know. This uh, okay. the weather just changes here and everything is dependent on the weather. <clears throat> anyway, so shall I proceed? You, you've you given the summary of point number one already, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> now I think we just need to move to point number two, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah. All right. Everyone's saying okay. Alhamdulillah now. They, they're happy that you're back. So that's good. Okay. So Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam Rasulullah. So we said that habit <clears throat> number two, uh, which is, you know, after number one, which focused on having the correct knowledge. Habit number two is about emotional commitment you know that we should have that fervent belief it shouldn't just be an intellectual exercise uh, we know it you know academically we can list it off and define what the knowledge uh, totality is you know we have complete knowledge but we're not emotionally committed. And by not being emotionally committed, then it means you're not going to implement that knowledge correctly. You know, <clears throat> or your knowledge is confused and you are emotionally committed to incorrect knowledge. That's the other trap that you may fall into. 
So the knowledge has to precede. Knowledge should precede emotional commitment. But that emotional co commitment, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when it precedes knowledge, then it becomes a, a block to knowledge. Allah describes that in Surah Al Maida, verse 104, where He said, If you tell them, talking to Prophet Muhammad, if you tell them, Come to what Allah has revealed unto the Messenger, they will reply, What we found our parents doing is sufficient for us. Allah goes on to say, Even though their parents knew nothing, nor were they rightly guided. That's the emotional commitment. My parents did it. My grandparents did it. My great great grandparents did it. Are you saying they're all wrong? <laughs> this is the struggle when true knowledge comes and people who are emotionally attached and committed to false knowledge, you know, it, it blocks them from it. <clears throat> and that emotional commitment, the Prophet ﷺ did speak about it specifically. He said, no one truly believes, none of you truly believes until Allah and his messenger become more, more, more beloved than else in this world. Wow. That's serious emotional commitment. That Allah and his messenger become more beloved to us, we should love Allah and his messenger more than anything else in this world. So, among the people promised paradise by the Prophet Sallallahu was one who was emotionally bonded to a single chapter of the Quran. The Quran is what? It's Allah's word. That's bond to a, bonding with Allah. Anas ibn Malik related that a man from the Ansar used to lead them in prayer in Quba Mosque, the first mosque of, his, of Islam. Whenever he began to recite a chapter in the prayer, after the opening chapter, he would first recite the whole of the chapter, Qul Huwallahu Ahad. We know it as Surah Al-Ikhlas. Then he would recite the chapter. He used to do that in every unit of prayer. So those praying behind him spoke to him about it. Asked him, stop it. Why are you doing this all the time? Reading Qul Allah at first. When the Prophet ﷺ came to them, he used to come to Kuba every Friday. They complained to him. So he asked the man, was leading them. What prevents you from doing what your companions have asked you? And what is causing you to recite this chapter in every unit of prayer? The man replied to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we don't even know what his name is. He replied to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I really love it. I love that chapter. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the rest of them, while saying to him, your love of it has put you in paradise. Subhanallah. That is something his people were upset about. And the Prophet ﷺ said, because of his emotional commitment, his love of that chapter, which led him to recite, and of course, reciting it in, in, before every surah is not haram. It's not, it's not a question of haram or halal. You know, it was just what he liked to do, what he felt driven to do because of his emotional attachment to that surah. So the love of Allah is a facet of sincerity of one's belief in him. Although loving Allah might seem somewhat abstract, the reality is that every reason that humans find for loving other human beings exists in their relationship with God, but on a much greater scale, a much grander scale. It is the nature of human beings that if someone does something good for them by giving them something that they needed or wanted, that they like this person. 
it's natural you know kids grown ups all the same whoever gives you something wins your heart allah has blessed humans in many more ways than can possibly be counted so he deserves their wholehearted and unconditional love if that love is not there people are in fact denying his blessings and mercy to sincerely declare faith in allah while denying his mercy is an impossible combination to claim that one believes in allah and at the same time denying his mercy these two don't come together there has to be real love for allah underlying the declaration and no other form of love should equal or surpass it which is why allah said in surah al-baqarah also verse 165 and there are some among people who take partners aside from allah whom they love as they love allah but the believers love allah more than anyone else walladhina amanu ashaddu hubban lillah their love surpasses exceeds anything else in this world the prophet sallallahu also said if a person has the following three qualities he will taste the sweetness of faith that allah and his messenger are more beloved to him than anything else that's one of the three that allah and his messenger are more beloved to him than anything else loving allah may seem difficult to achieve as god is unseen and his blessings are not always apparent consequently great stress on gratitude is made in islamic teachings it is true gratitude that love can develop from the daily prayers al fatiha which begins with the phrase all praise and thanks are due to allah alhamdulillah to thanking other human beings about which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever doesn't thank people don't thank allah whoever doesn't thank people they also don't thank allah and in general the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam advised against jealousy saying look to those below you as it helps to you to remember allah's favor on you by reflection on allah's blessings and contemplation on his gifts the love of allah can be developed and that love is expressed in a variety of different ways for example crying for the sake of allah one of the signs of sincere sincere love sincere love of allah is crying for the sake of allah its importance was stressed by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a number of statements that he made and abu bakr and omar they are all known for crying during prayer etc abu huraira quoted the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as saying the fire will not touch a person who cries out of the fear of allah until milk returns to the breast He was also narrated he also narrated the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying two eyes have been forbidden from the hellfire hellfire will never touch them an eye which wept out of fear of allah and one which stayed open throughout the night guarding islam and his family from kufr but the eye who wept the eye which wept out of the fear of allah and among the seven shaded by allah's throne on the day in which there would be no shade it's another group of seven the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said one whose eyes fill up with tears when he remembers allah or she remembers allah in private 
So it's not surprising to find it a common feature among the companions of the Prophet who were promised paradise. When the Prophet was on his deathbed, he instructed Abu Bakr should leave the Salah. Aisha told, Aisha his daughter, told the Prophet and the Prophet's wife, of course, if Abu Bakr stands in your place, O Messenger of Allah, the people won't be able to hear him due to his excessive crying. So instruct Omar to lead the prayer. The Prophet Sallallahu again said, instruct Abu Bakr to lead the prayer. Aisha then suggested to Hafsa to tell the Prophet Sallallahu not to let Abu Bakr lead the prayer. When she did so, he said, stop. You are like the women of Prophet Yusuf. Tell Abu Bakr to lead the prayer. Hafsa then scolded Aisha, saying, you've never done me any good. You know, <laughs> mashallah. <laughs> but uh, that's the point. Abu Bakr, regardless of the fact, you know, as Aisha advised, he was the one. The Prophet ﷺ wanted him. This was part of the sign that he was to follow him. He was to be the leader of the Muslims, you know, in spite of this factor. Abdullah ibn Shiddad, he related that Omar ibn al-Khattab's crying could be heard from the last roar, rows of the prayers when he recited the verse, I only complain of my grief and sorrow to Allah. I mean, he was not doing it as much as Abu Bakr, but he did when certain verses hit him, touched his heart to that point, he could be heard crying all the way to the last rows of the prayer. And this is in Masjid and Nabawi. You know, this is the biggest, it was the biggest masjid at that time there in Medina. It is also related that whenever Uthman ibn Affan, these are all the people who Prophet said are among the people who would be guaranteed paradise. That whenever Uthman ibn Affan stood at a grave, he would cry until his beard became wet. On one occasion, he was asked, why did he not cry at the mention of paradise and hell? But he cried at the grave. He replied, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, the grave is the first abode of the hereafter. If one is saved from it, then what follows is made easier. And if one is not saved from it, then what follows is made more severe. So here are classical examples of that emotional commitment. Developing that love for Allah, obviously it's not something inborn. It's something which we have to acquire, which is why there's such a great reward for it. Its foundation is correct knowledge of Allah and his attributes. And its infrastructure is sincerity in application of that knowledge. How can we develop it? One, we can develop it by working on taqwa, our consciousness of Allah. Taqwa, the inner dimension of obedience, has been identified as a source of knowledge and piety. Ittaqullah yu'allimukumullah. Fear Allah and Allah will teach you. We can strive Number point number two, we can strive to increase our knowledge re by reading the Quran and the Sunnah. As Allah told us, I will guide those who strive for my sake to my paths. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا Also, the Prophet ﷺ told us to remember death. Visit the graves. That was point number three. 
Point number four, seek forgiveness from Allah. Seek forgiveness not just by saying Astaghfirullah, 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 no. By saying Astaghfirullah while remembering our sins, our mistakes, our errors. So that the seeking of istighfar, of forgiveness from Allah, has real meaning to it. And it's not just a ritual where people's fingers are just moving, you know, as if they have gotten, you know, some form of mental diseases, brain diseases, etc., which cause you to lose control of your limbs. But saying istighfar, better to say after your prayer, astaghfirullah and remember a sin so that your istighfar is sincere than to make thousands of istighfar. People have huge, thicker beads, long, with thousands of beads on them, you know, counting them. But it's just a ritual. They're thinking about other things, planning other things, and their hands, lips, tongues are making the sounds of istighfar, but they're not seeking Istighfar. And also make prayers sincere. Abu Ayyub related that a man asked the Prophet to teach him some brief words. He said, Whenever you stand for prayer, pray a farewell prayer. Don't say any words you will regret later and don't wish for what others have. Make prayers sincerely for Allah. Point number six, reduce laughter. Don't be the life of the party. Whenever you come, you make everybody laugh. No, it's no harm in making jokes sometimes, etc. But to be a joker, you know, known as the joker, this just kills the heart. Because Prophet Sallallahu had said, don't laugh too much because excessive laughter kills the heart. Seventh point, force yourself to cry. You can't cry, whether in prayer or making dua, whatever. Tears are not coming. Then force yourself by thinking about whatever caused you to cry at some time. Because of course, we all cry. Sometime, somehow, somewhere, those memories are still in our heads. So if we could go back to the memory, we can cause ourselves to cry. Prophet ﷺ said, Oh people, cry. If you can't cry, then make yourself cry. Because crying softens the heart. And then pray for it. Make dua. Prophet ﷺ taught us Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa'. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from knowledge which is of no benefit. O min qalbin la yakhsha. And from a heart devoid of fear. O min aynin la tadma'. And from an eye which doesn't become filled with tears. O min du'a'in la yustajab. And from unanswered prayers, prayers which are not answered by Allah. So, we have examples, I gave an earlier example of that individual who was emotionally attached to Surah Ikhlas and because of that love for that chapter which is words of Allah the Prophet ﷺ had promised him paradise. Now, we all, as we said, can achieve this because Allah hasn't made this condition, this 
requirement, something which is only within the realm or the ability of few. It is something achievable by everyone. And I've listed eight different uh, principles that one can follow in order to develop this quality of emotional commitment to the deen. Now, moving on to habit number three. We must completely trust in Allah. Our complete trust is a necessity. This is one of the characteristics of those who make it to paradise. And Allah has told us very clearly, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ It is in Allah that those who trust should put their trust. So true belief that nothing takes place in this world without Allah's permission and that he is ultimately the creator of everything which exists should lead to complete trust in him. It's coming out of our, our knowledge. Where does the trust come from? It's not coming from nowhere. It just comes from the heavens into our heads. No. It is from knowing Allah and how Allah works. That knowledge takes us to the point of trust in him. And that's why trust is a major part of our faith. Okaja ibn Mihsan. Shukran, baby. That's my daughter telling me that the electricity came back. <laughs> Excuse me. Okaja ibn Mihsan was among those promised paradise in this life by the Prophet. However, the reason for his being among them was due to his inclusion in a large group who were promised paradise by the Prophet. Allah is sufficient for whoever puts their trust in him. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he related that he heard the Prophet say, the nations were presented before me. And I saw a prophet with a small band of followers and another with only one or two people and yet another with no one with him. When I saw a large group, I thought it was my nation, but I was told that it was the nation of Musa, Moses and his people. Then I was told to look at the horizon where I saw a very great group and I was told this is your nation. There are among them 70,000 persons who will enter paradise without any reckoning and without any punishment. The Prophet ﷺ then asked, or he asked the, those who related, obviously the angels relating to him, about who they were and was informed and then he related to the companions as Ab Abdullah ibn Abbas related saying who they were they are those who do not make incantations themselves Rukia. nor do they ask that it be done for them nor do they read bad omens into events and they place their trust in their Lord. Here are the conditions. They don't make ruqya on themselves. This is beyond what the Prophet has taught us to do like 
doing the calls before we go to sleep at night, etc., etc. And they don't run around asking people to make rukia for them all the time. We have people who it's just, you know, they just run from one rocky to another rocky to another rocky. People telling them to do all kinds of things. Mm. Drinking water that has been recited upon, you know, writing in zafaran words of rukia on paper or dish and pouring water on it and drinking that rubbing oil, which is special oil because Quran was read over it and all these other kinds of things. People running around doing. Nor do they read bad omens into events. You know, they don't, when such and such happens, oh no, this bad, bad is coming now. In other words, they remain optimistic. They're not pessimists. You know, fearing here left and right because of incidents that are beyond their control, they read into them bad news and they place their trust in their Lord. When the Prophet ﷺ finished saying this, Ukasha ibn Mihsan, he stood up immediately and said, please pray to Allah that he make me one of them, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, you're one of them. Then another man stood up and asked, please pray to Allah that he make me one of them also. The Prophet ﷺ said, Okaja has beaten you to it. End of story. Okaja got it. So, putting their trust in Allah. This was the key. Tawakkul. Tawakkul. We have other companions who were given the same promise based on this tawakkul. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was also promised paradise for commitment to placing complete trust in Allah. Abu Dhar said, one day Allah's messenger called me and said, will you make a pledge for paradise? I replied, yes. I stretched out my hand and he placed a condition on me saying that you will not ask anyone for anything. I said, yes. He added, even if your whip falls, you're on your horse, your whip that you hit the horse with to get going or speed up, it falls from your hand. You must dismount and pick it up yourself. You don't ask anybody. Please pick up that whip. Pass it to me, please. Of course, this is not halal and haram here now. This is about a commitment to trusting in Allah at a level that most people can't. It can be done, but it requires what most people don't have. They don't, they're not able to sustain it. Another companion, whose name was Thauban, he quoted the Prophet on one occasion as saying, who will guarantee me that he will not ask anyone anything and I will guarantee him paradise? He said, I will. And I never used to ask anyone anything. That was his commitment. So that is a level of trusting in Allah that we can strive towards, minimize our dependence on others, and trusting in whatever decision Allah has made in our lives. But like the emotion of love that we spoke about earlier, trust is not inborn. It is learned and developed. So there are principles that we can follow that can help to build our trust in Allah. The first principle is to have correct belief and knowledge about Allah. Believing, for example, that Allah knows best. As Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah, perhaps you may dislike something and it's good for you. And you may like something and it's bad for you. 
Allah knows. Wallahu ya'lamu. And you do not know. Wa antum la ta'lamu. That's reality. We can accept that. Part of that uh, correct belief and knowledge about Allah is to know that Allah is just. And your Lord will not oppress anyone. Whoever uh, trusts in Allah will find him sufficient for him. Also, the principle that ease follows difficulty. With every difficulty comes ease. So these are concepts which Allah has put in the Quran, which are the foundation in terms of knowledge necessary to build that trust in Allah. We can also reflect on the examples of the lives of the early prophets and the righteous in the Quran and then the companions of the Prophet All that examples can show us uh, the way. And also being in the company of those who have strong trust in Allah. You know, that rubs off on us when we are around those, attached to those, close to those who have good, firm trust in Allah. It helps us to build our own trust. And then, of course, there's du'as that we make, like du'a al-istikhara, which help us, helps us in the trust. There is Salat al-Hajjah, which people do, but you should know that Salat al-Hajjah is not authentic. But dua al-istikhara, yes. Whenever you have a decision that you want to get Allah's guidance in, you put your trust in Allah. After making the decision, by making the two units of prayer and making the supplication, dua al-istikhara, and those that those duas or that dua itself is basically about putting one's trust in Allah. You're saying, oh Allah, if this is good for me, and my life and my deen, then make it easy for me. If it's not good for me in my life and my deen, take it away from me. So you're looking for Allah's guidance on the matter. Habit number four. We'll save for next week. Yeah. I think with all the struggles <laughs> that we've gone through here, we better quit. <laughs> Well, we're ahead. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Just check the uh, rain clouds uh, for next week, Sheikh. And just let us know if there's going to be a storm uh, coming. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll put it off, SubhanAllah. Uh, yeah, that is Ababa in Ethiopia. Uh, the weather is quite temperamental over there today. So, SubhanAllah, we've had uh, interruptions. But Sheikh Bilal has got to three of the points of the successful person in this world, alhamdulillah. And uh, it's been a, a pleasure, as always. But we're going to restart this lesson uh, from uh, point number four next week at 10 a.m. UK time, which is, is it uh, 12 uh, midday uh, at its Abu Bar time? And mm. that will probably be about 9 p.m. Uh, New Zealand time. That would be correct, I think, of all of those uh, three destinations in the world. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make it easy for our brothers and sisters to be able to follow the first uh, three points. Uh, so for us to follow the correct knowledge. And obviously, that means be a Muslim and be upon the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallam, and the righteous best predecessors like the Sheikh has been mentioning. Alhamdulillah. And have an emotional connection, connectivity with that, uh, you know, that knowledge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, for us to be really engaged fully and committed emotionally, intelligently, um, psychologically, in all ways, physically, of course. Um, and and uh, also, the, 
uh, trust in the law, which is our last, our third point, yeah. you know, which is which is en en encompassed in the sixth pillar of Iman, that is Qadr. What is the belief in Qadr but trust in Allah? Yes. So That's the point. Yes. Trust. Trust. Putting that trust in Allah. We trust that Allah has decided what is best for us. Yes. Qadr Allah wa ma'asha fa'al. Allah determines and whatever he does, he wishes, he does. And we have to believe that it is for the best. Um, Insha'Allah. Very good, Sheikh Bilal. Jazakallah khair. So we've gone through those points. We'll, point number four would resume at 10, once again, 10 a.m. UK time, Saturday. That's Saturday. So just every Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Or if you're in Addis Ababa or that uh, neck of the woods in Africa, then it will be uh, 12 midday. If you're anywhere near New Zealand, then it will be 9 p.m. So you've got the three time zones there. And you can work out where you are according to the, those three time zones and what time you need to join us. But until then, from the Voice of Islam team, from myself, Yusuf Chambers in Leicester, UK, from Sheikh Bilal in Addis Ababa, we will leave you um, uh, and we pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to have these first three points firmly, firmly established in your life. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh Bilal and the audience. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.